Good morning. We are glad you're here with us this morning. We're also glad those that are online are with us as well. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to get out today uh, after the week that we've had, that's for sure. But we're glad you're here. We, we want you to help us sing This Is Amazing Grace. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter, the King of glory? The King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquers the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquers the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. You may be seated. Good morning. I'll be reading five. No, I won't. Uh, I'm going to be reading from First Pro Proverbs chapter one, 
beginning verse 24 through verse 31, and then another. Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention, and you neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof. I will even laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes on like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come on you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they shall not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would not accept my counsel. They spurned all my reproof, so they shall eat of the fruit of their own way. And now in chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice. And he preserves the way of his godly ones. I want to read something that I have had written a long time ago in front of my Bible and, and then we'll pray. Our understanding of divine truth is limited by our own spiritual condition. Dull ears cannot deceive, receive deep truths. The Lord has much to teach us that we cannot yet bear. Let us pray. Almighty God, your word has been given to us for our edification, for our building up. In Ephesians, you wrote, Father, that the purpose of the church is to train us, to develop us into disciples, to become Christ-like. Salvation is provided through the free gift of the Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Accepting that makes us babies. We're born again. But like in our natural birth, we then have to learn. And that learning process takes a long time. But the more diligently we apply your word, the more we know your word, the quicker we grow. We still have this old sin nature in us as believers. And that fights against it because that's a self-centered nature. And so our process, Father, of learning is to take your word in, to make it a part of us, so that it changes us to be more Christ-like. So, Father, we come to you. We do not want to be those to whom you will not answer because we have rejected your word. We want to learn your word, Father. We want your word to change us, that we might be ambassadors for Christ, obedient servants. So, Father, feed us with your word. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and that teaching ministry. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn this morning is hymn number 329, Grace Greater Than All Our Sin. We'll three, see, sing all three verses, and the thing that uh, we don't think enough about each day is how great, how amazing His grace is for us, that's for sure. Please stand as we sing all three verses. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there with the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. 
What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe, all who are longing to see His face. Will you this moment His grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. I once was lost in darkness night, yet thought I knew the way. The sin that promised joy and light had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would be but as I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cause, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love display, you suffered in my place, you bore the wrath for me now all I know is grace hallelujah all I have is Christ hallelujah Jesus is my life hallelujah all I have Lord, I would be yours alone and live so all might see the strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose and let my song forever be my only boast is you. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus is my life. Hallelujah. All I have
you, God. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for all that you have done for us. We didn't deserve it. God, that's how much you love us. Thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you that our chains are gone. That sin that has bound us is gone because of what you have done for us and your free gift of grace. Lord, I pray this morning as we continue to worship that you be with Brother Dylan and give him the words to speak this morning from your holy word. Lord, as I pray, as I pray every week, I pray that if there be somebody here today that doesn't know you, that they come to that saving grace today by asking you to come into their hearts, asking for forgiveness of their sin, repent of that sin, and ask you to come to their hearts. Lord, I pray that you would be with all that goes on today as we worship you in song and in word. Thank you again for this time. Thank you for the chance that we are here to praise you, the one who has given us life. Here is first sin, so we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas great. That taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone. I've been set free, my God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy rings, unending love, amazing. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy rings. Unending love, amazing. shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine my chains are gone I've been set free, my God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace, and like a flood, His mercy Unending love, amazing.
amazing grace. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, children will go out for Children's Church. Well, as always, it is such a joy to step into this pulpit to proclaim the words of the living God. If you have a copy of God's Word, if you would go ahead and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, as we continue our look in this wonderful epistle to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, and we will be in verses 1 through 10 this morning. The title of our message is a very simple but a very familiar title, one we just sang, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. Ephesians, as we noted last week, was written by the Apostle Paul, the man who also wrote 75% of the New Testament. And when the Apostle Paul wrote this epistle, Ephesians, when he wrote it, he was imprisoned at Rome. And so oftentimes Ephesians is referred to as one of the prison epistles. And while Paul was imprisoned at Rome, he penned this amazing piece of Scripture. And if there was ever a piece of Scripture that I would encourage you to memorize, to commit to your memory, it is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Because if you understand Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, if you have that soaked into your heart and into your being, you understand the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you understand this text, you will be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is in Ephesians chapter 2 that we see that laid out so beautifully for us this morning. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, and if you would, please rise as we honor the reading of God's holy word. Ephesians 2 verse 1, this is the word of the Lord. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient, We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love that He had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in our trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavens in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages He might display the immeasurable riches of His grace through His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. Not from works so that no one can boast. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Let's pray together. Father, these are monumental truths that we see in Ephesians chapter 2. This amazing grace that you would extend mercy and forgiveness to sinners like us. That You would give Your Son for those who shook their fists in rebellion towards You. Father, the Scriptures are clear that every single one of us is born dead in our trespasses and sins. We all have sinned and fallen short of Your glory. It doesn't matter who we are, what background we have, we've all sinned. And we are all in desperate need of your grace and your mercy. 
that you have so richly supplied in Christ. Father, I pray that you would help me this morning to explain these wonderful truths. I pray, Lord, that Christ would be exalted in our worship this morning. And if I say or utter anything that is not in accordance with your word, I pray that it would be forgotten, but that only Christ would be lifted up. And that he would be glorified in our time together. And Father, we pray that if there are those in our sanctuary this morning or even watching online who have never bowed the knee to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith, that today would be the day of salvation for them. That they would see their sin for what it is. And that they would see their need, desperate need for a Savior who is Jesus Christ. And Father, for your people, I pray that we would be encouraged by this text. That we would be reminded that our salvation is not dependent on anything that we have done, but on who you are. And we are so thankful for that. We pray that you would use this time for your glory. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. This past week, I've shared with you that we each night we try to have a time with our family that we call family worship, where we sit down with our kids and we have a children's Bible and We sing, Jesus loves me with them, and we pray with them, and then we read a passage of scripture from that Bible. And this past week, we were reading in that Bible about Jesus' death on the cross. And as we talked about that, Chandler got really sad, and he started actually crying. He said, but I don't want Jesus to die. Why did Jesus have to die? And so we began to explain to him that Jesus died for our sins. And we tried to explain to him what sin is and that we've all sinned. That We said, you know, Chandler, mommy has done bad things. Daddy has done bad things. Everybody has done bad things. And so Jesus died for our sins. And we were naming off all the people that they could relate to and telling them that we've all done bad things. We've all sinned. And... Chandler seemed to accept that. He seemed to understand that mommy and daddy had done bad things. But then we said, you know, Brother Bob, even Brother Bob has done bad things. And that just rocked Chandler's world. He, I mean, it just shook his whole worldview. He said, Brother Bob has done bad things? He said, yes, even Brother Bob. And so, Brother Bob, that's a testimony to what my son thinks of you. <laughs> But I know you all are so shocked. I mean, that's <laughs> But I tell you that because you notice in, in verse 3 that Paul reminds us, each and every one of us, what we were before Christ. Who we are apart from Christ. And this is a reality that is true for each and every one of us. It is true for me. It is true for you. No one can escape this. And you notice that Paul uses one word to describe who we were apart from the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And that word is dead. Dead in our trespasses and sins. Notice that he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient, we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclination of our flesh and our thoughts, and were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. Paul reminds us who we were apart from Christ, And apart from the saving grace of Jesus Christ, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. No matter who you are, no matter what background you may come from, every single one of us is born 
spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins. Every single one of us is born with a sin nature that says, I don't need you, God. I'll be my own God. I'll do things the way I want to do things. I don't need a creator God to tell me what's right and what's wrong. It doesn't matter if you come from a family of faithful believers or if you come from a family of God-hating pagans. It makes no difference. We are all born spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins. And if you have children, you know this. We all have a sin nature. I can tell you that I think that my children are the cutest little human beings that God has ever created. But there are times when they remind me that each and every one of us was born with a sin nature. Born dead in our trespasses and sins. Just the other day, we were feeding our kids and we always... It's such a battle to get them to eat their main meal. And normally their main meat or whatever it is, is chicken nuggets. And Nora did not want to eat her chicken nuggets the other day. And we said, Nora, you're not going to get your dessert until you finish eating your chicken nuggets. And she just kind of puckered up and, and looked at us like she just was, that wasn't going to happen. She wasn't going to eat those chicken nuggets. And... So we sat down and we started eating our food and we were just kind of glancing at Nora out of the corner of our eyes. And I literally watched my little sweet angel take her chicken nuggets and take them and hide them in her high chair. And she didn't realize I was watching her. And then she said, I'm done, Daddy. And I said, did you eat your nuggets, Nora? She said, yeah, I did. Lied right to my face. <laughs> but man... You know, Kristen and I, we didn't have to teach Nora to do that. We didn't have to teach her to lie. We didn't have to teach her to be self-centered. We didn't have to teach her to be shady when it comes to eating her nuggets. That's not something she learned to do. That's a part of her sin nature that each and every one of us is born with. In fact, in the book of Romans... A piece of scripture that the Apostle Paul also wrote. In Romans chapter 3, Paul gives this description of our brokenness, our sinfulness. In Romans 3, 9, the Apostle Paul, he quotes from the Old Testament. And he says this, as it was written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands there is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good. Not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Viper's venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. A very poignant and a very powerful description of our brokenness, of our sinfulness. Apart from Christ, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. So in other words, the story of our salvation is a story of resurrection to life. It's a story of resurrection from death to life. It's not a story of us cleaning up our life. It's not a story of us getting our act together. So if I was to ask you, what has Jesus Christ done for you in your life? Your response should not be something like, well, you know, I was a drunk and I struggled with that for many years, but then I eventually just got my act together and I cleaned things up and just really improved my life. 
No. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. The story of our salvation is not that we cleaned ourselves up, cleaned our life up, but that we were dead and were brought to life, spiritually speaking. The good news of the gospel is not a message of self-improvement. It is a message of total transformation. We are new creations, new creatures in Christ when we are saved. It's a message of death and resurrection to spiritual life. You know, it's very common in our culture today to hear people say things like, you know, what you need primarily most in your life is you just need to love yourself more. You need to focus on what makes you happy. You need to spend more time on yourself. Or you need more self-care or you need more positive vibes or however you want to say it, whatever you want to call it. But brothers and sisters, you can take a dead skeleton and you can have him focus on as many positive vibes as you want and as much self-care and self-improvement as you want and that dead skeleton is not going to get up and come to life. And the Bible describes our condition apart from Christ as dead in our trespasses and sins. This, that is true for all of humanity, spiritually speaking. And while the world is busy offering us self-improvement and this and that and all kinds of various false religions, there's only one person who has the power to bring life, and that is Jesus Christ. There's only one message that can bring rebel sinners to life, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. There's only one person who can take dry bones and cause sinew and skin to form on them, as the prophet Ezekiel describes, and that is Christ, the message of the gospel. And no matter how hard we try in our own man-made efforts, there's nothing we can do in our own strength, and our own power, there's no amount of self-improvement strategies or no amount of good works that we can do to bring about spiritual life. It can only come from Christ. Total transformation. And Paul lays out for us in the first three verses what we were before Christ, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that we were under the wrath of God. Because of our sin, just as the rest, without any hope of saving ourselves. And if the text ended in verse 3, then we might as well close our Bibles and go home. We'd be without any hope. But notice what he says in verse 4. The amazing grace of God that we see the amazing grace of God to intervene on the part of rebel sinners, those who would clench their fists in rebellion towards the God of the universe. He says in verse 4, a very famous and probably a familiar passage of Scripture to you, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love that He had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might display the immeasurable riches of His grace through His kindness to us in Jesus Christ. Before Christ... We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were spiritually broken with no way to fix it. But God is the one who intervenes. Notice it's not us, it's God who steps in. It's God who makes a way of salvation for rebel sinners like us. And you feel the weight of that 
In the beginning of verse 4, Paul has already described in great detail who we were apart from Christ, that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. And then you see this beautiful transition into verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love that He had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in our trespasses. Think about that in relation to your life. Think about every wicked thing that you've done in your past, every sinful thing, every shameful thing, every secret sin that might even still haunt you to this day. Then put that up against this verse, but God, but God who is rich in mercy because of His great love that He had for us made us alive with Christ. God did not save you because He thought you were so awesome, because He saw some merit in you. He did not save you because He thought, wow, if I save them, what a, how lucky will the kingdom of God be? They are so amazing. God did not save you because of anything good in you. He saved you because of who He is. Because of His great love. Because of His rich mercy. Let that be an encouragement to you. The next time that you are discouraged, maybe the next time that you feel, I am just such a failure, I have blown it again. How could the Lord ever love me? How could the Lord ever forgive a sinner like me? Remember that God saved you and He sustains you even now because of who He is, because of His great love, because of His mercy. Not because of how great you are, not because of how good you are. And He saved you for His glory. That's why Paul can say in verse 6, you are saved by grace. He also raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavens in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages He might display the immeasurable riches of His grace through His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God saved you so that the universe might see the amazing grace of our God. The immeasurable riches of of His grace and His mercy, that this God, this holy Creator God, would stoop down and He would save a wretched sinner like me and like you. He has put on display for the entire universe His glory, His mercy, His love. And He will be glorified in your salvation. He will be glorified in your sanctification. And we will spend all of eternity worshiping and praising Him for what He has done, for who He is. Sunday morning, when we sing songs of worship together and we praise the Lord for who He is, for what He's done, for His amazing grace, that's just a taste of what we are going to do, brothers and sisters, for all eternity together. To worship our King and thank Him famous hymn that we sang last week and we sang this morning. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It rings so true. So true. Notice that Paul says in verse 8, he says, For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. Not from work so that no one can boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared ahead of time for us to do. You know, if you were to interview three individuals from our major three religions in the world today, If you were to ask an Orthodox Jew, if you were to ask a Muslim, and you were to ask a Christian, 
The same question. When you die, where are you going and why? If you were to ask a, an Orthodox Jew that, you would probably get a response like, well, when I die, I'm, I'm going to paradise. When asked why, he might say something like, well, because I read the Torah every day, because I do this, because I do that, and I'm a good man. I'm a good person. If you were to ask a devout Muslim, when you die, where are you going and why? They would say, well, I'm going to paradise. Well, why? They might say something like, well, because I, I read the Koran, because I do this, because I do that, and I'm a good man, I'm a good person. But if you were to ask a genuine Christian, where are you going when you die and why? They would say, I'm going to heaven. You say, well, why? Well, not because of anything I've done. Not because of any good works that I have achieved. But I'm going to heaven because 2,000 years ago, the Son of God shed His blood for me. Died to pay the price for my sin. And He rose to bring salvation to the world. You see, this is the difference between Christianity and every other false religion in the world today. Every false religion has one thing in common. It's do this and be saved. And that might look like many different things. But it's do this, do that, and you can attain heaven. You can attain salvation. Whatever you want to call it. Maybe after you've done enough good deeds. Maybe after you've been baptized. But biblical Christianity says you can't be good enough. You can never attain heaven on your own. You can never reach God on your own. God is the one who reaches down and brings dead sinners to life. God is the one who must intervene. We can't save ourselves. He raises us from spiritual death to spiritual life. That is the good news of the gospel. That's why Paul says, For you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. No true Christian should ever boast about how great a Christian they are. If we truly understand what God has done for us in Christ. No true Christian should have the attitude that, wow, God is so lucky to have me. Isn't the kingdom just so fortunate that God saved me? No true Christian should have that attitude. If we're going to boast, we boast in God and God alone. We boast in the cross of Jesus Christ and who He is and what He's done. Because we understand that we have been saved by grace and that even our faith is a gift of God. You notice that He says in verse 10, For we are His workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Our good works do not save us. They do not save us, but they are evidence of our changed heart. They are evidence that God has worked a miracle in our lives. And he says that God has prepared them ahead of time. For us to do. He's prepared our sanctification. Our growing in holiness. Ahead of time. Making us more and more and more. Like Jesus Christ. Making us more and more into the image. Of the Lord Jesus Christ. In light of this text. I want to challenge you. If there was ever a piece of scripture. That I would challenge you to commit to your memory to work to memorize, it is this text. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Even if it's just, maybe you have a terrible memory, and even if it's just two verses a week, if there was ever a text of Scripture that I would encourage you to memorize, it would be this Scripture. And maybe if you say, I, Brother Dylan, I have a terrible, terrible memory, I could never memorize that many verses, then I would encourage you to at least read this verse every day. 
Write it down every day. Familiarize yourself with it to the point that you could explain it to someone. Because if you know these verses, if you understand what is being communicated here, you will understand the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It will be an encouragement to you in your times of need. And it will also provide you with an opportunity to share the gospel with an unbeliever. Maybe you have a family member or someone close to you in your life who you know is lost and you want to share the gospel with them but you're not really sure how. Use this as an opportunity to say to that person the next time you're around them, you know, my pastor challenged me with something to memorize a verse. Could, I, could you help me with that? Could you help me walk through that verse and just share the gospel with them? This is an amazing text of Scripture. These are amazing truths that God would save spiritually dead sinners like us. That He would give His Son for rebels like us. We will never be able to fully wrap our minds around what took place on Calvary's cross. For all of eternity... We will praise the Lord for what He has done in saving us. This amazing grace. And I pray that each and every one of you and everyone watching online has experienced that grace. Has been brought from spiritual death to spiritual life. But the only way that that can take place is through placing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Through trusting Him as Savior and Lord. And you can do that right now. We're going to have a time of invitation in just a few minutes. You come and you make that decision to put your faith in Christ. Maybe there's another decision that the Lord has placed on your heart. Maybe it's to join our church. Maybe it's to be baptized as the Lord has commanded. Whatever it may be, we encourage you to come and to make that right. Let's pray together. Father, it is amazing grace that you would take spiritually dead sinners like us, dead in our trespasses and sins without any hope of saving ourselves, that you would be the one who would step down and save, that you would send your Son the Lord Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, that you would send Him into a sinful world to live a perfect life and to suffer and die in our place. Father, might that motivate us. Might that spur us on in our walk with Christ and our growth with holiness and our desire to be faithful witnesses for Christ and to share the gospel with those around us. To always remember who we were apart from Christ, what you saved us from. And Lord, that sin nature still creeps up at times. We have not been perfected yet. We still sin, we still fail, we still stumble every day. Father, I pray that we would be encouraged to know that one day sin will be completely eradicated from this earth. That you are making all things new. And that we will be with you. You will be our God and we will be your people for all eternity. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Oh, so are you weary and troubled, no light in the darkness you see. 
This life for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strange. Lead him in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and we follow him there. Over us sin no more at dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. What a wonderful hymn of our faith. Thank you all so much for coming out and worshiping the Lord with us this morning. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're so thankful. We pray that uh, you have felt welcome this morning. And if the Lord is, is dealing with your heart in any way, if there's a decision of any kind resting on your heart, I'll be at the front. You probably don't want to go out uh, our front doors this morning. I think there's still some snow out there, so make sure you exit out the side here. I'll be up front. Stop me and, and talk with me about how the Lord is working uh, in your life. Don't forget that tonight we will continue our Sunday night uh, Bible study in the book of Esther. We encourage you to come out and, and join us for that in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, and also our Awana uh, and youth continue on tonight. So we encourage you to come out for that as well. And Monty, do you want to go ahead and share a few more announcements? Yeah, I've got a couple other announcements. You'll have a seat real quick. I'm not going to go through everything. But there's a couple things in the bulletin. Uh, of course, mentioned about tonight and Awana, youth and adult Bible study. The other things are uh, in your bulletin. February 25th at 5 is a safety team meeting in the Fellowship Hall. February 28th after morning worship is children event team leadership meeting. Uh, like I said, there's other things in the bulletin. The other thing I would like to mention this morning uh, is Mildred Forker's uh, visitation is today from 1 to 6 at the funeral home. And the funeral is tomorrow at 1. Any other announcements? Sure. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for your word. Lord, it's so important for us to realize each day that it's not anything that we do as far as receiving eternal life. It all comes from you. Lord, thank you for that gift because we don't deserve it. But what a wonderful free gift you have given us if we accept it, if we accept you in our hearts. Lord, I pray, thank you for Brother Dylan as he has challenged us to memorize your word. Hide it in our hearts so we don't sin against you. Lord, I pray you'd help us to not only memorize it and try to memorize it, but be able to share it with others. Thank you again for this time. I pray you would be with many folks that have lost loved ones here in the last several days. I pray you continue to be with the, the Wiggins family, be with the Forker family, be with Hopgood family, be continue to be with the Lynn family, and they're hurt and continue to comfort them. Lord, I pray you'd also be with those that are sick, Thank you again for this time. Thank you for the chance that we have to be in your house. And thank you for your amazing grace. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.